It's Monday. It's May 6th. And the word of the day is hobbledyhoy, which means an awkward, ungainly youth. Used in a sentence, stop calling me hobbledyhoy, I am old now. Right? Yeah, no, it sucks that the only part of that we lost was the complimentary part. <laughs> Heathledyhoy, right? is that anything? Oh, Heathledyhoy? <laughs> sure. It's a noise. I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright, and broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Marjorie Taylor Greene swears revenge on things for happening. The other side is literally killing their dogs now. And we talk about the best, worst campaign ad of all time. <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, No Illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, it's Matreon. And that means you, our adored listeners, can make us do stuff. Every new or upgrading patron across all the shows gets us a step closer. And you can check out Matreon.com to see all the goals. M-A-Y-T-R-E-O-N.com. So you guys have any favorite goals that you're looking forward to? I know, but there's a favorite that I'm looking behind to. That's right. <laughs> Coffee going up our butts is an option, and No Illusions is more afraid of Cameo No You Didn't he podcast is, list. He is. You we all are. can make all this are. happen. Ass coffee. Do it. <laughs> In our lead story tonight, everything is going so badly for Donald Trump still. Evergreen intro. He is on trial <laughs> for 91 felony charges in four different states. We just got a new indictment in Arizona regarding the fake electors conspiracy, including Rudolph Giuliani and Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows. So I guess five states. Truth Social is a dumpster fire of financial failure. He keeps getting fined because he's physically incapable of following official orders to just shut the fuck up during his ongoing legal proceedings. Mm -hmm. All his former associates are narking on him so hard. He keeps falling asleep in court and a teleprompter malfunction made him descend into complete madness last week. And he's apparently running for... I think president of the United president States. Yeah. United States. Yep. 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 And if 538 is to be believed, winning. He 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 can't Ridiculous. succeed at any single thing except possibly the thing that should be the hardest. Okay, but between us, right? How many times does 538 have to be wrong before we stop listening to them? They're they're the sitcom weather guy of politics. Or at you this could point. statisticians. What? Doing percentages I mean. don't know what percentages mean, and I refuse to learn. You know this <laughs> yeah. about me. It's important. We flipped two tails in 2015 and 2016. Everyone's panicking. Impossible. Yeah. It <laughs> means that a coin would it never bad, turn tails again. But that's not crazy. That's so, how it works. Some of the worst news for Trump came during the hush money trial in New York, where the prosecution is currently presenting its case to prove that Trump was involved in lying on official business records to hide all the bribes and other shady payments. Prosecutors got testimony from David Pecker, the former CEO of the media company that owns the National Enquirer. Pecker described in detail the arrangement he had with the Trump campaign in 2015. That plan had two main components. For the first part, Pecker would have the tabloid run negative stories about Trump's rivals in the GOP primary, like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. Trump's fixer, Michael Cohen, would collect insane rumors and send the negative story ideas to Pecker. Then the writers at the Inquirer would draft up an article and send it back to Cohen so the Trump team could look it over and give final approval. Newspapers do not generally do that. No, Even not, not piece generally. of shit tabloids <laughs> that should not be called newspapers like the National Inquirer, they do not generally do that either. Yeah, but I love that he went with the real story of Jean Bonnet at last paper. Like even when it comes to <laughs> buying his fake news, he went cheap. Yeah, sure did. And here's the second part of the plan. Pecker would buy up any negative stories about Trump and sit on them to prevent them from ever coming out. That includes the story from a Trump Tower doorman who claimed that Trump had secretly fathered a child. Pecker told Cohen about it and then bought the story for 30 grand and killed it. Another example was the story of Karen McDougal, 
a former model who had a sexual relationship with Trump while Melania was pregnant with Barron. According to Pecker's testimony, he gave McDougal a fake contract for a ghost-written column and paid her $150,000 for lifetime rights to the story, which that was what was actually being paid for. So with the bills piling up, Trump had to get some money together to pay back Pecker. So he had a meeting with Cohen about it. And we know about that meeting because apparently Michael Cohen would walk into Trump's office with like a pop filter sticking out of his shirt and record everything that ever happened. And Trump's an idiot, so he talked right into it. Prosecutors played that recording of that meeting last week during which Trump says, OK, what if Pecker gets hit by a truck or whatever? We need to buy all the bad stories. Then Cohen starts talking about setting up an LLC to finance that payment. And Trump says, what financing? Pay cash. And my favorite part, Pecker never got paid. So Trump got caught doing a giant ridiculous bribe, but also got caught for being a giant piece of shit who never actually paid his giant bribe. Right. No, yeah. Like if, if you had to wait until the physical money had changed hands, like in the movies, Trump would be immune from bribery charges, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's why I'll never be accused of bribing my credit card payment on time. Wait, is that what you meant? What? I nope. wasn't listening. I was, <laughs> uh, did I do it? So from there, can't be tales. The, the, uh, the rumors about the affair with Stormy Daniels started popping up and Pecker was on the phone with Cohen again. This time, n knowing that Trump's a scumbag who doesn't pay for anything, Pecker refused to lay out the money to buy the story and told Cohen that Trump needs to buy it himself. So Trump and Cohen did that for $130,000. But they're idiots who left a very obvious paper trail that includes falsifying business records to cover up the nature of the payment. Meanwhile, Trump was <laughs> nodding off in court and almost drowning in a puddle of his own drool so many times. Yeah. His lawyers would pass him a note and his <laughs> nodding head would snap back up with a <laughs> string of drool still coming down. He'd make a weird noise. And, no, I was like, I was like, lie about it. And this led to the word Adderall trending on social media last week, <laughs> along with pictures of Trump looking like he's, you know, hung over at a Saturday morning math class at college. It also led to Trump's latest paranoid delusion that the court sketch artist is out to get him, <laughs> which he <laughs> ranted about with his team. So I'm sure the artist hates Donald Trump, but the drawings are just like accurate drawings. Right. And by the way, when he wasn't complaining about that, he was ranting about how cold it was in the courtroom and claiming that the temperature in the courtroom was a conspiracy <laughs> against him. Conspiracy <laughs> against him. Donald, if anything, I'm watching the pictures, by the way, because Heath has put them in our notes. If anything, this sketch artist has given him 20, maybe 25 pounds. Right. You should be pretending to hire this guy, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> so with all that stuff happening... And Trump already in a giant snit and his dedicated staffer printing physical copies of good news <laughs> from the Internet with, I guess, literally nothing on the page. Just being like, it's blank again, but here's some paper. Here you go. With all that happening, Trump had two campaign rallies. Reminder, he's running for fucking president somehow. In the first rally, he tried to make fun of Joe Biden by saying, isn't it nice to have a president who doesn't need a teleprompter? And then in the very next rally that same day, we got a beautiful gust of wind from the loving God of the universe that really exists. <laughs> and Trump's teleprompter got turned away from him. So he decided to ad lib. It went so very badly. He said, quote, these teleprompters are gonzo, folks. They're gonzo. And then he stops and he's like, I hate to use the word folks. Cross out the word folks. I don't know who he's talking to who would be crossing that out, but he says, cross out the word folks. You ever hear Biden? Every other word is folks. Okay, folks. It's like a nervous habit. I don't use the word folks. End quote. Wow. I did not just say that word six times in the last 23 seconds is a bold <laughs> lie even for him. Mm-hmm. And then the crowd cheers. Yes. Do. What do you think <laughs> they think they were cheering? They, they just, oh, no a idea. sentence ended. Pause. What do we cheer? You guys want to do Let's Go Brandon? That's still hip, right? There we go. <laughs> Clap them up, the clock. So, folks, folks, 
<laughs> that's how badly it's going for Donnie. And I guess with a segue that requires no explanation at all, we'll take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, the wonderful folks at BetterHelp. Folks. And on March 24th of 2022, you corrected my pronunciation of the word Clementine, even though we were the only two people talking. Dude, stop. Come on. Hey, hey, guys, what, what's all the hubbub? Eli's telling me all the reasons he's been mad at me for like a billion years. Don't be ridiculous. Heath. I'm just getting stuff off my chest. With a list? Yeah, I, I wait until someone angers me 50 times. Then I calmly list all 50 times at once. It sort of clears the pipes, you know? Eli, that doesn't sound healthy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Noah. I just don't know another way. Well, have you tried therapy? Therapy? For communicating better? That's right. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, and it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. I don't know, guys. I hear therapy's super expensive. Not BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a fraction of most out-of-pocket therapy, and financial aid is available. Wait, it is? Yep. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Skeptocrat. All right, guys. Thanks. I can't believe that you thought that was a good way to tell people you were mad at them. It's, it's kind of stupid, honestly. Okay, that's it. Noah, on December 19th of 2018, you said blech when I walked into a room with my lunch. <sighs> Here we go. And we're back. Next up in headlines in Green's New Deal News. Mike Johnson did a thing last week. And if there's anything Congresswoman and pull-up mutilator Marjorie Taylor Greene hates in a Speaker of the House, it's stuff doing. So this week, she has sworn to oust Johnson in a desperate attempt for this Republican <laughs> Congress to embody the nothing in the phrase, it's better than nothing. Okay, she'd be <laughs> calling an already doomed vote that would accomplish nothing in her capacity on the Committee of Nothing in order to heroically fail at finding a new speaker who's more willing to do nothing. But right. nothing's going to happen again, to be clear, because it's already doomed. Yes, yes, it's nothing upon nothing upon nothing. But the fact that Republicans aren't willing to do their jobs in any capacity until a crazy lady threatens to cut off their Johnson is another one of those winks from the simulators, I think. Right? right? We get it. Like, how do we get out, though? That's the question. We yeah. got it. We're in. Yeah. We understand. It must be exhausting to be MTG. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but it actually does get better than this, because it's not just Republican infighting, a state of affairs we've had the pleasure of enjoying since, I, I would say, 2015. No, see, evangelical Christian and porn sponsor to his own son, Mike Johnson, has folks in his corner. Because it looks like coming to the rescue of Republican Speaker of the House this week will be... The Democratic Party. People <laughs> who prefer something. Right. To be clear, in other Ooh, words, yeah. is that tagline taken? Yeah. <laughs> As predicted, by the way, on the last episode of this show, right, because the Republican need to outsource adulthood is so obvious at this point that they might as well just say it themselves. Exactly, yeah. So in a statement, minority leader who Marjorie Taylor Greene thought you were only allowed to call that behind his back, Hakeem <laughs> Jeffries, <laughs> explained that his party would stand against the ouster, saying, quote, at this moment, upon completion of our national security work, the time has come to turn the page on this chapter of pro-Putin Republican obstruction. We will vote to table Marjorie Taylor Greene's motion to vacate the chair. If she invokes the motion, it will not succeed, end quote. Not adding, you know, just like everything else she's ever attempted. Right. Apparently, this is a decision they came to because watching Republicans desperately flail about at the mercy of their craziest member is fun to precisely one degree less than watching the country flail about at the mercy of that member is terrifying. So. Yeah, he's doing the thing that Noah has to do when Heath and I are like, and then I'm a green chicken and I'm a purple chicken for 14 minutes in the middle of a game. He just gets real quiet, starts to hit a beeper <laughs> on his end to get a clean <laughs> edit. That's what Hakeem Jeffries is doing. Yeah. So. As you can imagine, Tragic the Gathering responded with her usual brand of batshittery, saying, quote, Mike Johnson is officially the Democrat Speaker of the House, adding, 
What slimy backroom deal did Johnson make for the Democrats' support? He should resign and switch parties. If the Democrats want to elect him speaker, and some Republicans want to support the Democrats' chosen speaker, I'll give them a chance to do it. End quote. What the fuck are you talking about? You'll give them nothing. The right. motion's going to fail. This isn't complicated. And if they want Mike Johnson to be the speaker instead of a different Republican. Oh, look, it already happened. It's <laughs> yeah. done. Right. Are doing sorry, anything. Did, did she really think she was going to trick him with the my inability to fire you means you should quit line? Did she just try to fucking wabbit season him out of the speakership? <laughs> well, you know, it did work on that one manager at Claire's, so she's yeah, sort of well, riding right. high on that. <laughs> she also added something which I think is rather enlightening. Uh, she said, quote, I'm a big believer in recorded votes because putting Congress on record allows every American to see the truth and provides transparency to our votes. Americans deserve to see the uniparty on full okay. display. I'm about to give them their coming out party, end quote. I, I can't tell if she doesn't know what that means or if she's calling Johnson gay in like a schoolyard taunt. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and look, I actually kind of think she has a point here right because like look politics has largely been able to do business by saying the things that appeal to your most extreme wings of your party while doing the things that involve compromise and you know running a country most of the time the problem is like both parties indulge this for so long that now both of them have true believer extremists who want to do the things they've only been pretending to want. And while the world and Congress would certainly be better without Marjorie Taylor Greene, there's no doubt that she's made her party show their asses. And as we knew all along, if I may stress the metaphor, turns out they're full of shit. Mm -hmm. My favorite part is when she made her big announcement about her nothing plan last week. She said, the uniparty is make Ukraine great again and she held up a blue and yellow hat that she made as a prop because she's the fucking carrot top of congress and yeah, it said so Muga many ways, on yeah. it and immediately tons of people wanted to buy a Muga hat so Midas Touch made a replica and started selling them with all the proceeds going to pro Ukraine charities that's made a amazing. bunch of money oh you love to see it awesome and in putting the cute in execute news since the inception of our podcasting empire, whenever we've needed an over-the-top example of a terrible thing that would be universally reviled among any remotely reasonable electorate, the example that we've reached for has been puppy murder. But, as yet more evidence that exaggeration is physically impossible in the age of Donald Trump, Republican Vice Presidential Hopeful and South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem brags about doing exactly that in her upcoming memoir, No Going Back. I mean, to be fair, turns out she nailed the title. Didn't she, though? <laughs> okay. Okay. I know it's illegal to call for the murder of another person. Sure so I'm he... not doing that. That's definitely not what's happening right now. I'm just saying, this is a hypothesis. This is a scenario. If we did make that sort of thing legal for just the one type of thing... It's a purge on puppy killers, right? It's what uh, you would obviously. use as a hypothetical. Yes. It's what you'd right. be like, all right, let's use a silly example. <laughs> we can't use it. Anymore as a silly example, though. So apparently the excerpt, which was released last week by The Guardian, was meant to be an anecdote about how she's willing to do the right thing even when the right thing is hard. Uh, the right thing in this case being shooting a puppy to death for being uppity with her. Uh, the incorrigible canine in question here was Cricket, a 14-month-old female wire hair pointer that Gnome described as in the book as, quote, a trained assassin with a, quote, aggressive personality. And after the dog killed a bunch of the neighbor's chickens, she decided enough was enough, dragged it out to a gravel pit on her farm, and shot it to death. And then, apparently just hysterical with bloodlust, she went on to execute a goat that had been giving her shit, too. That, okay, that's the crazy thing, right? Even from her perspective, right, where she's the kid from Old Yeller, Travis doesn't turn from Old Yeller's cooling corpse and go, and you know what? Fuck you too, Billy. Pit. Right, like, yes. Yes. why would you include? <laughs> yeah, well, if that it, happened, he wouldn't write about it, probably, <laughs> right? Probably, yeah, if it happened in real life, it wouldn't have made the book. That's the thing. Even if you're remotely inclined to give her the benefit of the doubt here, I should add that she actually uses the words, I hated that dog. 
in her book when she's describing the situation. She wasn't even like, well, you know, and I loved Cricket, and of course I wanted what was best for her, but recognizing that she might be putting other uh, animals and people in danger and apparently wholly unaware that there are agencies that take fucking problematic dogs and rehabilitate them or whatever. She didn't say anything like that. She says in the book, I hated the dog right before adding, quote, at that moment I realized I had to put her down, end quote. Okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay. I don't know if you know this podcast listener, but these books, right? They're ghost written. Right. No politics book you have ever read was written by the politician who quote unquote wrote it. All right. I hate to burst your bubble, but ghost writers usually do a series of interviews and then they send the drafts to that politician or someone on their team for their approval. So my question is, what the fuck was this ghostwriter yes! doing? What would they say they do here that they kept the puppy killing? Insane. Or the ghostwriter said, hey, um, I cut the line that says, I hate dogs. But Christy Nome was like, fuck that. I do hate dogs. That needs to be in the book. Uh, also, Photoshop a white streak in my hair for the jacket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Now, needless to say, this revelation has not improved Gnome's national standing and probably wouldn't even if she had the restraint to leave out the part of the story where her kids get home and ask where Cricket is, which, to be clear, she didn't. She left that in. Um, it's led to widespread outrage, amazing memes, and a new bipartisan congressional caucus called the Congressional Dog Lovers Caucus. She's so been condemned funny. from both sides of the political aisle, including by notorious dog torturer Mitt Romney. Rough. Yeah, at least Mitt was like, well, I didn't put it in my fucking book. What the <laughs> hell? Yeah, right. Right. And of course, in addition to distancing themselves from the puppy killer, Republicans are also openly marveling at how a politician could just like not just make such an unforced error, but keep making it right. Because all week last week, she could not stop talking about killing her puppy. She, she started with a post on social media last Friday, uh, the day that the story broke, that tried to clarify things and garner sympathy, but instead confessed to having killed three horses the week before. <laughs> Okay, here's the thing about the puppy. I clubbed a baby seal. Fuck. Yes. I right. did that just now while I was saying that. Right. She's like, oh, come on. I'm, also, I'm on a farm. We kill animals all the time. I killed three horses just the other day. That that was her, like, trying to defuse the situation. Where and did that, I get this baby seal? <laughs> and when that doesn't work, she defended herself by pointing out that somebody really probably should have killed Joe Biden's bitey dog by now, if you think about it. Um, she followed that up a few days later with a lengthier post where she claimed that the puppy murder showed her to be an authentic leader who didn't, quote, shy away from tough challenges end quote like for example shooting a puppy that trusts her okay honestly i think the american people have had their fill of feeling like the puppy our leadership is willing to murder <laughs> right yeah so when killing horses listing other people's dogs she'd also like to shoot and bragging about how badass killing her puppy really was didn't work out for her she switched on thursday to blaming the fake news media claiming that the only real problem here is that the lamestream media was putting a negative spin on her righteous puppy murder um, but she still couldn't shut up about it because, at least in part, she's still promoting the fucking book where she brags about it. That doesn't come out until Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. She has so much press tour left to go. Yes. Okay, fucking Fox and Friends have her lined up for next week, and they're going to talk about anything except the puppy murder, or at least they're going to try. <laughs> yeah. She even went on Hannity and tripled down. Yes. Arguing that technically... Cricket wasn't a puppy. She was 14 months old. Yes! Seriously. Her entire PR team was like, hey, Christy, shut the fuck up. Everything you say is making it worse every time you say anything ever. And she was like, people need to know I murdered a grown-up dog. I'm a hero. Yes. Well, tween dog. I'm a hero, though. Sean Hannity gets it. And, and look, lest this gets lost in the conversation amid the amazing memes, and they are amazing, we should at least acknowledge how fucked up this anecdote is, even if you give her every possible benefit, even if you set aside the immorality of murdering puppies, which is a really hard thing to do. This is still a story about her seeing that a thing in her care had a problem and solving that problem by killing that thing. And given the Republican stance on shit like criminal justice and immigration, I feel like that aspect is worth dwelling on, too. <sighs> yeah, a little. And in drawing a Blankenship news, Don Blankenship is allegedly an ex-Republican who's running for U.S. Senate in this year's election as 
a Democrat. He's a liar. He is not a Democrat. <laughs> but regardless, he's hoping to win the seat that's being vacated by Joe Manchin of West Virginia, another so-called Democrat. On top of being a liar about his actual party, Blankenship is also a platonic villain in the universe <laughs> who is the millionaire CEO of a coal mining company that killed 29 of its workers via negligent homicide. Negligently homicidal platonic villain who lies about his party. Like if anybody's qualified for Joe Manchin replacement, dude, that is the guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we don't want the people of West Virginia getting the hate bends. Have you considered that? <laughs> the hate bends? And a big, big thanks to friend of the show and dungeon master extraordinaire Alex Cloud for the link. Skeptocrat news at gmail.com if you find a good one. So here's a little more background on Blankenship. From 2000 until 2010, he was chairman and CEO of Massey Energy, one of the largest coal companies in the country. He had to step down in 2010 when a tragic explosion at one of their mines killed those 29 workers. Investigators looked into the matter and found pretty solid evidence that experts told Blankenship, hey man, if somebody shoots like a single angry bird at your janky ass mine, the whole thing's gonna explode and kill a bunch of people. And he very much ignored that. Eventually, he got convicted of conspiring to willfully violate safety standards, leading to a jail sentence of a year. And that was his resume to become a Republican politician at that point. His callous disregard for safety killed 29 people in the mindless pursuit of profit. Heath, how much more qualified for Republican politics can you get, though? Oh, I, I know what it is. Too many of the miners weren't black. Is that what holding in black? Is that some of them were white? Yeah, okay. So in 2018, Blankenship ran for U.S. Senate as a Republican, and his platform was toxic enough that Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump said he was too conservative. <laughs> and during that campaign... Blankenship released an ad in which he refers to McConnell as Cocaine Mitch, based on a, a nonsense claim about McConnell's father-in-law being involved in drug trafficking. Okay, Cocaine is like, hey man, don't associate me with Mitch <laughs> yeah, McConnell. That's right. not cool. <laughs> I'm delightful. And during that same ad, Blankenship refers to McConnell's wife, Elaine Chow, and her family as Mitch McConnell's China family. He also says, Swamp Captain Mitch McConnell has created millions of jobs for China people. What? Exact words. And when asked about the ad, Blankenship said it wasn't racist because Chinese doesn't count as a race. And then he explained, again, exact words. The races are Negro, White Caucasian, Hispanic, what? and Asian. <laughs> Well, and, I, and I have it on good authority that as long as you don't rank them when you say them, it's all right to list them. Terrifying. <laughs> okay. For some reason, white Caucasian seems like the most racist title on that list, right? <laughs> Does it? This, Does man, it? <laughs> this man has some hard opinions about which Caucasians are white. Yes. And he, he <laughs> wants you to ask. He <laughs> wants you to ask. Don't. Ask. This is the uh, podcast listener. I sometimes will text Noah and Heath on the thread they have to share with me because they gave me a third of their company. Like, I have a great show idea or I have a great business idea. And there's just a pause while they make while I make them go. What's your great business? This is him with racism. <laughs> White Caucasians. Follow ups. Anybody <laughs> <laughs> going to leave that on red. So apparently he Blankenship does. He learned does. his lesson from the. <laughs> extremely racist McConnell ad, and now he's going for a different artistic vision called pure insanity. It's so it's, crazy, it's dude. The best. Okay, when I first <laughs> saw the ads, these new ads, I assumed they had to be fake, but they're available to watch on Blankenship's Facebook page. The link is in the notes you if have anybody's to watch curious. Them. You have to watch them. Insane. We could do a GAM episode on them. We could yep. do an entire yep. GAM yeah, episode on these three ads. Bananas. He released three ads last week, and the first one starts with Don Blankenship standing in front of a framed picture of what appears to be a woman from, like, 1985 in, in a sequin baseball cap and a jacket made entirely of the American flag. 
So mm-hmm. already I had so many questions about what was about well, to happen. And, well, and you have to understand, too, that this man looks like Mike Lindell releasing a hostage video nine years into nuclear winter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know how early Tim and Eric really just, like, captured something innate about, like, the human experience of low-res sort of local TV? I now believe they were just videotaping Don Blakenship and then reenacting <laughs> it Schenectady, New York style. Okay, so all of the following happens during a 30-second commercial. After the intro shot of Blankenship and that crazy framed photo, we get a clip of RFK Jr. calling Blankenship the most honest CEO in the country. Then we get a pop scare showing people of color in U.S. Congress piano sting while the narrator calls them liars. Then the narrator's like, wait, sorry, forgot to mention that RFK Sr. got killed by the U.S. government. That's an important thing that I said before that. And then in the greatest finale, in the history of finales, they cut to Don Blankenship again. And he says, exact quote, if they tell you I fell off the bed and hung myself, I, I didn't. Exact words, end of video. <laughs> end of <laughs> political ad. It <laughs> says paid for by Don Blankenship yes, yes. as he utters those words. If he was committed to the bit, he would now fall off the bed and hang himself. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, honestly, if the government was committed to the bit, they would murder him. This would be the first time. <laughs> they, they might as well. Dedication to it. Yeah. So Blankenship, like I said, released two other videos at the same time last week. And again, I was almost certain they were fake. They had to be. So I looked some more, but I found a bunch of people from West Virginia making posts on Reddit saying like, what the fuck just happened in that blank and chip head? Are you guys seeing this? Can you imagine you're just watching TV and suddenly this happens? Yes. Craziness. Of course, the biggest confusion was about (laughs) bed-based hanging, and that's the literal finale of all three ads exact same thing if they tell you i fell off the bed and hung myself no i didn't so i did a bit more digging and the best theory i could find is that blankenship is convinced that jeffrey epstein never committed suicide but was actually murdered by the illuminati because he was about to incriminate powerful government people so to close his own personal campaign ad He compares himself to Jeffrey Epstein and he's telling everyone, I guess, as like a safeguard that the Illuminati might murder him and try to pretend he fell off the bed and hanged himself. So I'm not trying to tell anybody how to do their jobs or anything, but if he falls off his bed and shoots himself... Looks like the Illuminati is in the... The Illuminati (laughs) is all good. Nobody's been alerted to that. (laughs) Also worth noting, within minutes of Blankenship declaring his candidacy as a Democrat, West Virginia Democratic Party Chairman Mike Pushkin released an official statement saying, Blankenship, or as he'll forever be known, Federal Prisoner 12393-088, does not represent the party. So again, do not vote for Blankenship in the Democratic primary. It's coming up May 14th, I think. Maybe he'll have a, a bed mishap as a result of losing. You never know. You never know. Do you think his, you know how they let you do that little quote thing below your name? Do you think it'll be, I didn't hang off, fall off the bed and hang myself? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and in ticking talk news, the TikTok ban approaches ever nearer. And by ever nearer, I mean ByteDance would need to initiate a sale by September, which uh, wouldn't have to be completed till December. And and that's assuming there are no lawsuits before then, which hold the order, which there almost certainly will be. But but whatever. It's it's very scary. They're taking away TikTok any calendar year now. And TikTokites like myself no. will have to go back to that. reading shampoo bottles <laughs> and the rest what? of the Internet. While we poop. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, damn it, Eli. Now you've reminded me of all those years I spent wondering why nobody came up with a shorter term for methyl chloroisothiazolinone. Exactly, yeah. Okay, I will say, I like that you're shampooing, I guess. Keith, you know it's not mine. Come on. (laughs) Got it. Stupid. How dare you? Are you conditioning? I'm not doing anything. Are you kidding? (laughs) Uh, To that much hair? (laughs) All right, got it. Noted. Thank you. And look. 
I think it's worth us taking a moment to acknowledge why this ban is happening, right? Yes, I know the congressional hearing where they asked the president of TikTok which part of China Singapore is in was embarrassing. But the fact of the matter is, (laughs) China absolutely could and probably has harvested user data from ByteDance. And TikTok, the app, does a lot of things that apps aren't supposed to do, right? I've said this on the show before, but they have in-browser key capture on that app. And yes, TikTok isn't a browser like Safari or Chrome, but say you're on TikTok shop like myself because that cheese slicer does look awesome and you use that browser to log into your email or to get into your PayPal Those keystrokes are captured as a part of your user data, which they are not supposed to be. Hell, we're not even the first country to ban the app. India banned the app last year for this exact reason. Okay, and if you don't slice vegan cheese, it doesn't taste good at that point. I feel for you, Eli. (laughs) Right, but but the key here is that just because Republicans are motivated by xenophobia doesn't mean there is no good reason. It's just not the yeah. one they're using. Exactly. But those valid concerns aside, that hasn't stopped people from making some very, very stupid guesses. And if ever there was a stupid guess about who's behind something, you know that guess is going to be the Jews. Is it the Jewish people? Yeah, Yeah. it's the Jews. So the internet is positively brimming with folks blaming Israel, the country, for United States banning TikTok as part of the grand Jewish plan to stop the sexy dance app. Okay, by far the best thing Netanyahu's ever done. The most ethical thing he's ever done. <laughs> yeah, it's a compliment sure, yeah. if you think about it, right? Jesus, are we st- we're still going with controlling the media? Really? Would it kill you guys to come up with some new anti-Semitism? You've had 150 yeah, years on this one. A fresh take, maybe. Okay, one last thing about these conspiracy theories. Okay, one especially prominent one that's been going around the internet uses the words of a member of the Anti-Defamation League talking about the rise of anti-Semitism on TikTok as proof that the Jews are behind this. And and I point that out because th- that video clip is literally Iranian propaganda, right? The original source of that clip is from an article titled American Youth Break Free from Zionist Yokes posted in November of 2023 by the Tehran Times, an English daily published in Tehran by Mare News Agency, an arm of the Islamic Propagation Organization. Their title, not mine. (laughs) Okay, but if TikTok shuts down, bigots can just move their hate speech of whatever type over to uh, Twitter and Facebook for the very first time. It does, like the theory doesn't even make sense. Yeah, right. Now, yeah, now there will be anti-Semitism on Twitter. Think it through. And finally tonight, in Don't Ted On Me news, it's weird <laughs> that out of an entire world full of possible professions, Ted Cruz would go into one that's determined by periodic popularity contests. Because Not going to go well for you, bud. Right. Almost certainly the least likable person that there is and possibly <laughs> the least likable person that even theoretically could be. And yeah, Don Blankenship is close, but Ted Cruz yeah, definitely yeah, is still right, winning. Right. But here we are in a world where Ted Cruz is now campaigning for his third term as a U.S. senator, despite being an openly evil, sniveling coward who looks like something that you would keep in the aquarium because it eats the algae. (laughs) But it's not going as well as he hoped, so apparently he's now trying to rebrand himself as a bipartisan deal-maker. Okay, is it too late to run as Jewish? Fine, deal-maker it is, deal-maker it is. Hey, is this algae killing itself? I've never (laughs) seen it before. It's climbing up the side of the wall and just jumping over? What is that? Now, to be clear, Cruz is still polling way ahead of his Democratic challenger, Colin Allred, but... How? But not as way ahead as he'd like. It's Texas. It's Texas is, is how, exactly. Question. Yeah, they have so, people there. There are some, still people. <laughs> some polls, though, do have Allred within five points of the incumbent, and he's apparently been maintaining a slight fundraising lead on Cruz throughout the entire election cycle so far. So Cruz has started employing the if you can't beat them, pretend to be them strategy that Republicans favor on abortion these days. So he's been selling himself on the campaign trail now as a person who's unafraid to reach across the aisle and work with Democrats. 
when, in truth, the only thing that keeps him from being the most polarizing person in American politics is the fact that most Republicans don't care for him either. <laughs> yeah, he's got to be grateful to MTG for sucking up some of that heat, though, right? right I bet he yeah. sends her a nice basket at Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Blankenship's getting one, too. <laughs> right, yeah. So, yeah, so the Wall Street Journal ran a piece over the weekend detailing his efforts to make inroads with suburban voters. His campaign is running an ad now featuring Democrats for Cruz. Uh, the members of whom the people appearing on the ads are described in the ad as, quote, local elected officials, law enforcement, business owners and industry advocates who back Cruz in his election campaign. And really and, quote, totally real humans whose skin is just a little <laughs> saggy. No need for alarm. End quote. They're from Canada. Just like Ted Cruz. They're yeah. real. They have names. I won't say them. OK, Canada <laughs> giving us Ted Cruz. That is why NAFTA got replaced for real. Like Thank even you. Trump knew that had to go. Yeah. <laughs> so, now, as Cruz's ill-advised mullet would be happy to attest, the man is no stranger to rebranding. And I'm sure that joke is way funnier to members of his home world that are observing this from afar. And like the blobfish that his visage almost can't help but be compared to, he spent his political career squeezing into whatever crack he thinks will be most politically advantageous, even when that requires sucking Donald Trump's dick while his head is up his ass. But there are signs that Texas voters aren't buying him anymore, the most noteworthy of which is the fact that even this soft bone piece of shit thinks looking more like a Democrat will help his chances in November. And that, I think, is as happy a note to close on as we're going to find in American politics. <laughs> <sighs> Just a blobfish sucking Donald Trump's dick. Hey, don't bring me into this. Are you serious? <laughs> That's gross. That's gross. And you got that comparison. On that note. I'm insulted. We're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. One thanks star. to Eli Bosnick. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening. And Until please keep decide. telling your friends. <laughs> My people. We'll do a left headphone, right headphone thing. Here you go. Here you go. Senior Blobfish, you want to keep going? <laughs> First of all, senior for the senior verse has already grown beyond my control. I think we all agree that. <laughs> all right. We'll circle back to Mr. Senior Blobfish if he has anything else. If you find the naive stupidity of our giving away free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. So helpful. Please do that. Just like all the generous new patrons who will be complimented. Matreon! It's Matreon. We would really appreciate it. You can make really us get coffee it. enemas. You can enemas. give us an excuse Ask to get coffee. the coffee enemas that we all secretly want is what, we, what you could do. <laughs> I'll do an entire GAM episode of Senior Blobfish. There you go. <laughs> and whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Fucking incredible. I can't believe it's real. Nuts. I couldn't. Yep. Here's how crazy it is, Heath. I read your headline and I was like, I think Heath fell for like a yep. weird hoax. Sh I wrote thing. my headline and I was like, <laughs> I think he fell for the hoaxes. <laughs> Checking again. You pronounced it Clem Labine. Yeah. The, like the singer. The, the Brooklyn Dodger. Yeah. <laughs> I, the, the, it's so unrealistic that it's only been 50 times that I've made you upset since 2018. I know, I know. I know. This should be 2023. For. Last week. <laughs> At the beginning of this record. Since we started <laughs> this sentence now. Fuck you. Okay. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2024, all rights reserved.